Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace and Allah's mercy be upon you. Welcome to Universal Quran. Alhamdulillah wa salat wa salam ala rasulillah. We, pray, we praise Allah and ask for His blessing and peace upon His Prophet and Messenger Muhammad. The Quran is the scripture of Islam and it is the universal heritage of all mankind. Every human being on the face of the earth has the right to know this message of the Holy Quran because it was sent by Allah for everybody in every place and every time. And so it's part of our duty as Muslims to convey this message to the best of our ability to everyone who will listen to the Holy Quran. And we're trying to do just a little bit of that in this show, bringing the text of the Holy Quran in the original language as it has been preserved since the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself received it from the angel Gabriel 1,400 years ago. And then we bring the translation of its message into the English language and as well as some of its tafsir or interpretation and explanation from the original sources that we have at our disposal. So the Quran is a universal book, but it was revealed at a particular time and place. And in order to do that, we have to know a little bit of the background of the different verses as they were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad over the 23 years of his mission. For the Qur'an was not revealed all at once in book form, but it came down certain chapters, certain verses, one at a time, uh, depending on particular circumstances and events uh, during the mission and lifetime of the Prophet. May Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. Currently, we're on the 29th section of the Holy Quran, the next to final section. This particular section uh, was mostly revealed in Mecca in the early stages of the Islamic uh, uh, revelation to humanity. At that stage, uh, Allah SWT was largely uh, addressing the unbelievers in Mecca, those people who worshipped other gods besides their creator, their sustainer, Allah Almighty. They worshipped Allah through statues and images uh, whom they believed were saints, goddesses, uh, daughters and sons of God, angels, and even the jinn or the spirits. So they would worship and ask those beings, make their dua or their supplication to those beings, asking them to pray on their behalf to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, there are many people today who are similar to the Arabs in Mecca at that time, who, are, who have misconceptions in religion, who worship saints or walis or other beings, asking them for help, asking them for protection, uh, fearing the spirits, and so doing things to appease the spirits or the jinn out of fear of them rather than the fear of their Lord and Creator, as well as being involved in uh, the materialistic culture which is similar in our lifetime today as it was in the time of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. People were very wealthy. They achieved wealth through trade. They were of noble lineage. They were proud of their nation and their race. And they uh, despised people of other cultures, other races, and those who were less fortunate than themselves and did not help them give in charity and did not believe in one brotherhood of all mankind serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are many things which are analogous uh, in our world today to the situation at the time of these revelations in the 29th section of the Quran. Today we're going to be reading from chapter 70, Al-Ma'arij. To help us uh, in this reading, we have our brother Nuh, who is a, a student of the Quran at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt, and Brother Nuh is from uh, Ghana. And we have Brother Tahseen from the United States, another student of Islamic knowledge here in Cairo, who will be reading us the English interpretation 
of these verses. I'm going to ask Nuh if you could please read verses 1 through 3. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سأل سائل بعذاب واكع للكافرين ليس له دافع من الله ذي المعارج Thank you. I seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan, the outcast, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. A questioner asked concerning a torment about to befall, upon the disbelievers which none can avert, from Allah, the Lord of the ways of ascent. So these verses uh, are talking about non-believers or idol worshippers from Mecca questioning the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But this question isn't like they're asking him a question. It's like they're asking, making a request to him that something would happen. So instead of translating this as a questioner, you could translate it as a, somebody requesting something perhaps. And so they were saying uh, to the Prophet, who had been teaching them in Mecca, that there is one God who created the heavens and the earth, who has the attributes of perfection and superiority in every facet, in every positive attribute or positive characteristic that we would think of as being something good, Allah has that in a perfect amount, uh, far beyond anybody or any creature in this earth, and therefore He deserves to be worshipped alone. And if we reject Him, uh, there will be a day of judgment, there will be a resurrection from the dead, and we will be brought before His throne to be judged, either to be punished in hellfire if we have rejected His way, or to be granted Jannah or paradise if we have followed the teachings of the Quran. And so this person is requesting from him, rejecting the idea and disbelieving and ridiculing the idea of life after death or that he would be punished for his sins and saying then bring about this torment that you're promising us. Cause rocks to rain down from the heavens. In Surah 22, chapter 22, Al-Hajj, verse 47, they said, uh, Allah SWT says, "We istajaluna kabil adab." They haste, they want to hasten on this punishment from Allah. So they're saying to the, to the Prophet, "Bring on the punishment. Go ahead. We want to see this before you. If if the Quran is true, punish us right now and and cause our destruction." Also, in in chapter called Al Anfal, chapter eight, verse thirty-two, they said, "If this message is true, it is a true message from you, O Allah. Rain down rocks upon us from heaven." So they were ridiculing the Prophet Wasallam. They didn't really believe that this was from Allah, and they didn't really believe that Allah had the power to rain down rocks from heaven. So they didn't really want Allah to answer their prayer, but they were saying to Allah, oh, you know, in a, in a joking, ridiculing way, oh Allah, if you really have sent this Prophet and he's true and this book is true, then destroy us. And so they are making a, 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 a test or trial for the Prophet Wasallam. And so this verse is saying that this punishment is about to happen. It's about to befall those people who are disbelievers and none can avert it. It is from Allah, the Lord of the Ascent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will explain what the ways of the Ascent, that He is the Lord of the ways or paths of, asc of Ascension into the heavens in the next verses are going to be explained. But on this verse, it's saying, you know, uh, when they're asking Him to bring this about, why didn't it happen? Why didn't the Prophet say, okay, then I will have you all destroyed right now? It was within Allah's power. And in previous messages, when the messengers were rejected, they prayed to Allah, and Allah did destroy their people. An example is Noah. Or in the, in the uh, Middle East, in, in the Arabian countries, uh, Ad and Thamud, ancient people of the past who were destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this was actually a blessing and grace from Allah. That He, first of all, delayed the punishment to give them chance to believe in the message and become Muslims and to submit themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worshipping Him alone. And if they rejected, then to prepare for them a grave punishment. But if rain, stones rain down from heaven, it would perhaps destroy the believers and the unbelievers. And of course it would have destroyed people who were, according to Allah's knowledge, going to be guided to Islam. Many of these people eventually did become Muslims. And so they repented of this sin. And if Allah had destroyed them at that moment, they would never have had the chance to be 
uh, Muslims. So Allah did a great favor to us that He spared their lives. Uh, they became Muslims, and in fact, Islam became established in Mecca and in throughout Arabia as an example to us so that we can look to them and know how to live our religion today. We can look and see what will happen if we will submit ourselves to Allah's revelation, how He will raise us up to a high level as He raised them up from the level of being barbarian people who worshipped stones, who worshipped you know, uh, spirits and had a, a, a religion of ignorance with no wisdom and no benefit for them to raising up to the highest level of civilization in worshipping the one God of the heavens and the earth. So let's continue uh, with verses 4 through 18, please. <coughs> تحرج الملائكة والروح إليه في يوم كان مقداره خمسين ألف سنة فاصبر صبرا جميلا إنهم يرونه بعيدا ونراه قريبا يوم تكون السماء كالمهل وتكون الجبال كالإهن ولا يسأل حميم حميما يبصرونهم يود المجرم لو يفتدي من عذاب يومئذ ببنيه وصاحبته وأخيه وفصيلته التي تؤويه ومن في الأرض جميعا ثم ينجي كلا إنها لظى نزاعة للشوى تدعو من أدبر وتولى وجمع فأوعى Thank you. <coughs> the angels and the spirit ascent to him in a day the measure whereof is 50,000 years. So be patient with a good patience. Verily, they see it afar off, but we see it near. The day that the sky will be like the boiling filth of oil, and the mountains will be like flakes of wool, and no friend will ask of a friend. Though they shall be made to see one another, the criminal would desire to ransom himself from the punishment of that day by his children, and his wife, and his brother, and his kin kindred who sheltered him. And all that are in the earth, <clears throat> so that it might save him by no means. Verily, it will be the fire of hell, taking away the head skin, calling those who turn their backs and turn away their faces and collect the wealth and hide it from spending in the cause of Allah. Thank you. So Allah subhanahu wa is continuing and he describes why he is called in verse 3, uh, Dhul Ma'arij, or the Lord of the Ways of Ascent. And he says that the angels and the Spirit ascend to him in a day which is as if it were 50,000 years in our time. And so Allah is describing the vastness of this creation that even the angels ascending to the highest uh, heaven take a day which is 50,000 years in order to ascend there. It's 50,000 years by our time. And also that the Day of Judgment itself is 50,000 years long. And so it could also be referring to that specific Yom, which is a day which is 50,000 years long. The, the unbelievers are standing there sweating so much that the sweat is up to, you know, going up their, their body from their fear and trembling on the Day of Judgment. But for the believers, the Day of Judgment will seem as short as making a very brief prayer, one of your very brief prayers it will be very easy and very light on the believers and the people of faith but for the unbelievers it will be longer than their whole lifetime and longer than the lifetime of civilizations but it will be a vast great time and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of the angels who are not beings to be worshipped or gods but themselves take a great effort simply to ascend up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the spirit which can be the spirit of uh, of the human being who on the day of judgment being taken by the angels to be judged or the spirit of the angel Gabriel who's called a ruh or the Holy Spirit who
who is the angel of revelation. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be patient with a beautiful patience, O Muhammad. Uh, with this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all this power will uh, protect you. That's all we have time for uh, right now in this section. But uh, on the Day of Judgment, they will be uh, grave, a, a great punishment and nobody can protect them, not even their parents or children. They will abandon everyone and only consider how to save their own self, but they will have no power to do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from His judgment by leading us to Islam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. يهدي به الله من اتبع رضوان the second rule of al mim al sakina that is the letter mim so if the first mim is non vowel or sakina followed by a vowel mim so I will merge the first in the letter and I will pronounce them as one. مِّن And we spoke abundantly on the virtues of seeking refuge with Allah from the outcast Satan. Especially for the first reciter, he's got to recite it out loud. وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإذا جاءت الصاخة وإذا النفوس زوجت make sure it's ضمة وإذا النو وإذا النفوس thank you for joining us Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back to Universal Quran. We are studying chapter 70, Al Ma'arij. Before the break, we were discussing the Day of Judgment, a day which is 50,000 years long, but it will be an easy day for those people who have sincerely submitted themselves to Allah's will uh, by obeying the message of the Holy Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. May Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. Uh, then Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad, who is giving this message and is enduring persecution and difficulty, to be patient with a beautiful patience. And this is advice for all of us. Anybody who is struggling to live a good life, to live the Islamic life, and faces hostility or opposition from people, to be very patient. And a beautiful patience means that you look at patience as not having to endure something difficult that you hate only, but that it is an act of worship that Allah has tried us and sometimes things are difficult for us but it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if things are easy, we are, we're thankful and when things are hard, we're patient and we know we're getting a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter for our patience. So it's a good thing and it's a beautiful thing if we can endure. And we ask Allah, we don't ask Allah for hardship. We ask Allah to make things easy for us and we know that Allah will never try us with something that is too hard for us to bear. And so, uh, inshallah, may Allah will all of us to have an easy life, but sometimes we will have difficulties and we will have to be patient, just as the prophets of Allah had to endure very often difficult things. And one of the things that the Prophet had to be patient for is their ridicule, that they didn't believe in such thing as a day of judgment. And they thought this punishment didn't really, you know, didn't really believe in this punishment that was being promised by Allah. And that's why Allah said that to the believers... It is a close thing. It's a near thing. Allah has told us the Day of Judgment is near. Because any one of us tomorrow could, could die, today could die, and the time between our death and the Day of Resurrection, the time in the grave, will seem like less than a day. It will seem like a very short time. And so it will be as if tomorrow we wake up and it's the Day of Judgment. And so the Day of Judgment is close to everyone. And so the believer knows that. And so we work as if this is our last day on the earth. We pray as if it's our last prayer. We do everything as if it were our last opportunity to do something good before our deaths. And if we do that in a sincere way, living as if this is our last day on earth, then we have nothing to fear on the Day of Judgment from Allah, who is all-merciful 
and compassionate. But the unbelievers think that the day of judgment is far off, a long time away, because they don't really believe in it at all. And they think that this life is everything there is, and they're hoping and praying they will live a hundred years or more than a hundred years. But even that will seem like nothing to them. A hundred years of wealth and power, if you could have that, would be a great thing. But if you have to stand 50,000 years in the day of judgment to be judged for all of your sins and have your sins exposed to the world, then it wouldn't be worth it. Even a, a long, long life of ease and comfort would not be worth it. And so the believer would never accept that, oh no, the judgment day is far away. I have plenty of time, like you even hear Muslims say, I have plenty of time to repent. I can have a good time now and have fun. And then tomorrow when I'm old and I'm elderly, then I'll pray, then I'll fast and things like that and I'll repent at that time. But none of us know how long it will be until we face our Lord. And so that is not the sincere belief of, the sincere action of the believer to believe that way. But there is a day when it, which is coming near when, as verse 8 says, the sky will appear like the scum on top of boiling oil. That oil scum floats to the top. Or it will be like melted metal, like melted copper or silver or some other metal. It will be molten when the, the, the sun dies and the stars fall and the sky turns this strange color and dissolves. It will be the most horrific thing that people will see. It will be more horrific than seeing your own death in front of you because it's the end of the entire reality that you're aware of. And nobody is prepared for seeing such an amazing sight. The mountains will be like carded wool. Like when, when wool is combed and the fibers start flying in the air and any slight breeze will cause those fibers to float. Or like the dust that you see in bright sunlight, you'll see a beam of light and you'll see little tiny bits of dust which appear to us, it, it, we see nothing unless a beam falls on it then we see that the air is actually full of these little bits of dust. That will be the mountains. And so it's a terrific sight that is being uh, predicted here in these verses of the Holy Quran. On that day, you will have no friends. You have your close friend, your closest friend or relative that you love so much. And you will see him in, in bad difficulty. He's full of terror. And you won't go to help him, nor will he help you. He won't ask you, how are you doing, brother? And you won't ask him, because each one will be thinking only about saving his own soul, because it's forever. It's for eternity. And so, no closeness to anybody is worth giving up your position in heaven for hell. But everybody would do anything they could. They would give up. They would hope that Allah would trade for them their own children to get out of hell. Here, I will give you my own kids' lives. Put my children in hell. Don't put me in hell, O oh Allah. SWT. That's what they would like. And of course, most people would love their children more than anybody else on the earth. The father or mother loves their children, but they would give, gladly give up their, their children or their wife or their brother or their close relative who has sheltered them in time of need, people who have done great things for them, they would gladly give up those people in exchange for paradise. But they can't exchange anything. But as Allah SWT said, no one can bear the burdens of any other person. But everybody is responsible for himself or herself alone, and nobody can save anybody on the Day of Judgment. On that day, you would wish that Everybody in the earth would be taken. Take everybody on the earth, just save me, O oh Allah. And of course, that's not part of Allah's justice to punish any innocent person on behalf of the guilty. Uh, truly, as it says in verse 15, they will be in the fire of hell. Their skin will be melted away. The skin of their head will be melted away. And their whole body will be burnt up to a cinder. And then their skin will reappear, regrow. So they will keep feeling the punishment over and over again forever and ever. So each time it's a horrible punishment, you'll be burned beyond recognition, as they say, and then the skin and everything will be recreated again by Allah's power so that you will never have relief from the punishment, but it's something that, ten that lasts forever. The hellfire will be like the mother calling to her children on the Day of Judgment. The people who are marked by Allah as the denizens of hell, the people who are who are decreed for hellfire, she'll be like the mother gathering up her children, calling them unto her. And they will have, as Al-Hassan al-Basri, one of the second generation Muslims, one of the senior scholars from among the second generation, he said uh, that, that the, the, the hellfire will call to the children of Adam in a beautiful sounding voice. And then when they answer, then her terror will be apparent to them and they will be dragged roughly into the hellfire. Because 
you have heard Allah's warning, but you did not, you did not, uh, you did not uh, 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 heed that warning. And so just like a bird goes and plucks up seed off the ground in its clutches. Do you ever see a bird charge down from the sky and it grabs the seeds and picks them up? It takes not even a second. That's how it will be. Hellfire grabbing the people and dragging them in. Instantaneously they will find themselves <coughs> being carried down into the depths of hellfire. Uh, because they have rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in word, in their hearts, and in their actions. In their hearts because they worship other than Allah or did not believe in Allah and rejected Him. In their words because they did not say there is none worthy of worship except Allah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. They did not say the words of Tawbah and repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking his forgiveness and an action that they rejected uh, believing this Quran, praying, giving charity and other works, actions of worship. But instead they collected and hoarded the wealth of this world. Now I don't want people to misunderstand this verse. That people think that this means that it's bad for you to have wealth or to be a wealthy person or to have money or to have savings. And that's not what this is about. But this is about the person who has enough money to live on and to support all his family and his children according to their level in society, according to their standard of living in their country. And then still refuses to give in charity, to even give part of his wealth to support the poor and the needy, to not pay zakat or to have people who depend on him, such as his relatives or children or parents, who are in need and he does not share his wealth with them, even though he's required in Islam to help his near, uh, near relatives and kinsmen. And so that is the person who is being warned here. The person who has heard the warning of Allah, but rejected it instead hoarding this world. What will be the good of this, the hoarding of this world? As the Prophet wasallam said, that who would love to have his who would who would love to have his children's inheritance more than his own money who would love that his children have money not himself of course every one of us wants to have our own wealth we would prefer our wealth first not our heirs we're not worrying about our heirs in the future our children and grandchildren and their money we're most concerned about now but our wealth our money is what we spend and give in this world and we send it before us to the hereafter by giving it in charity. So when we give charity, we're actually saving money in the hereafter for paradise. So we're earning a higher reward in paradise, which is infinitely better than any wealth or power or money that we could have on this earth. Well, if, if we save our money and hoard it, what happens? We die, and then who gets it? Our, our heirs. So instead of us enjoying the benefits and fruits of our money in this life and in the hereafter, our heirs get it, our children, grandchildren, maybe people who we don't even know or don't even like. Maybe we'll have descendants who we don't, wouldn't even like them if, if we knew them. And yet they will be enjoying the fruits of our labor, living off of our money. So what good is that? So it's a foolish thing that you would be leaving and wasting money here on this earth. So, of course, be successful in this world. Earn as much as you can. Uh, ha let your family have a good standard of living. And... Give your obligatory zakat. And if you have surplus money, give extra money. Help your relatives, <coughs> your, your neighbors, and those people who have uh, a, a good relationship with you. They will be pleased with you. They will pray on your behalf to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything that you give in that way will be stored up for you as a much greater reward for you in paradise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in these last verses is showing us the terror of the day of judgment. And what will happen to you if you reject? Not just to you know, cause you tre trembling and anxiety, but to make you realize that this is the time of action now. To live according to whether this day of judgment is near or far. And may Allah call, cause all of us to be guided to the belief in the day of judgment so that we can act according to it now, in the here and now, that we may merit uh, Jannah, Allah's paradise in heaven in the hereafter. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Thank you.
لله كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون